Okay, we're going to be um, looking at a snippet from the Joint House uh, inquiry to September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, where Carl Levin, a panelist, interviews Kofor Black of the Counterterrorism Center, Chief of the Counterterrorism Center, and Dale Watson, who's the Assistant Director of FBI's Counterterrorism Center. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh welcome our two witnesses. I want to go back to uh, some of the testimony here of uh, Mr. Black, where you acknowledged, as uh, has um, Mr. Tennant, that the CIA fell short, using your words, and not informing the Department of State that you had identified two Al-Qaeda men. Uh, these were the two Al-Midhar and Al-Hazmi who were hijackers on Flight 77. These were two people you had identified uh, back in January of 2000 and in March of 2000. Uh, there's another problem here beside failing to notify the State Department, and that was failure to notify the FBI. Uh, the FBI says that it did not know of key bits of information, and that a visa had been issued to one of them, and that the other one had actually entered the United States until August of 2001. So there was not just a failure to notify the State Department to get these folks on the watch list, but the CIA was aware of the fact that the one of them had a multiple entry visa and the other one had actually <coughs> entered the country uh, in March. Why was, and by the way, this is not nothing to do with intelligence information and nothing to do uh, with uh, not crossing a line between uh, criminal uh, investigation and intelligence in, uh, investigation. This was public information. This was a visa had been issued and somebody had traveled actually to the United States. My question is this, why, why was the FBI not notified by the CIA of those two critical facts about two people that the CIA had identified as terrorists uh, until August of 2001? Um, we, uh, because of the uh, nature of our work being very fast paced, there was communication. Um, and, uh, there was communication between the CIA. Pretty vague answer, if you ask me. There was communication. Um, and Carl Levin is going to quickly um, relate to him a specific incident. Um, there was no communication between the CIA and the FBI in regards to Khalid al and Nawaf al-Hazmi in data. Um, in fact, it was intentionally withheld from them. And this is coming from uh, the FBI who worked there, like Mark Cusini, who have I interviewed, um, Doug Miller, uh, Margaret Gillespie, and Ed Getz. Um, so there was an intentional withholding of information regarding Khalid al and Nawaf al-Hazmi even entering the United States, let alone uh, them possessing U.S. visas. Now, this was withheld from them for 16 months. They were finally told in a national security briefing in August of 2001, weeks prior to the 9-11 attacks. Let's see what Black has to say, because he's lying right now. Eight officers in the counterterrorism center um, and individuals in the FBI, particularly a CIA officer assigned to the FBI, their phone conversations, emails, things like that. Yeah, okay, let me bring that up. The CIA assigned to the FBI, that would be Tom Wilshire, who is the former uh, deputy director of the Alex station, or Bin Laden issue station, who was, um, he was, uh, he relocated to the FBI's counterterrorism unit. Now, he was the exact reason why uh, the information regarding Khalid al and Wafazi was not shared. Now, I've, uh, you know, I sound like old hat here, but, um, you know, I'll say it again here. It was it, when the cable came in that Khalid al and Wafazi had U.S. visas and were coming into the United States when they were stopping at a hotel at the United Arab Emirates, in which the CIA broke into their room and took pictures of their passports and sent it to Alex Station. Uh, one of the first people to read the cable was Tom Wilshire. The second one was Doug Miller. Doug Miller was immediately drafting up a cable to warn FBI headquarters about two known Al-Qaeda operatives who had a, a nefarious past 
they were involved with the allegedly involved with the uh, USS coal bombing, as well as the uh, um, 1998 East Africa bombings to an extent. I don't know how, but um, nevertheless, they were known to the counterterrorism center as being Al Qaeda operatives. And that information had to be authorized by Tom Wilshire, who's the deputy director. And he, he put on the cable, please hold per Wilshire. And then when Mark Rossini actually went to complain about why the cable wasn't sent, um, Michelle Ann Casey, who was tasked to the counterterrorism unit and who was head of the Yemen ticket or the Yemen Al Qaeda hub in Yemen, she was in charge of that operation. She said, it's not an FBI matter. And that when they want to let the FBI know, we'll let them know. But this is not a domestic issue. Even though these guys were coming inside the United States, that makes it a domestic issue. In particular, the lapse that um, we're referring to is to do the, the, the extra work of submitting a formal report to the State Department uh, into their lookout system, tip off, so that action can be taken. Um, there was communication. I think you have a very good point. We have admitted to the lapses of not submitting a form, a report in a form that um, would be actionable, but there was communication, but there's also um, uh, an incredible amount of work. Yeah. Let and me just there was, there was, about the lack now. of communication. You see, there was communication. I, I'm, I'm gonna focus on those two specific critical facts. Yes. Are you saying that the CIA did communicate to the FBI that those two people that you suspected as being terrorists had a multiple entry visa into the United States and had entered the United States. Are you saying that in that communication, that general word you're using, that those two facts were communicated orally to the FBI? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is the identities, the names of the individuals. No, no. Were, but but the issue of the visa is 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 problematic. No, no, it's not. Um, since they are considered terrorist operators and that they're coming inside the United States, it's no longer a CIA issue. Even though the information is coming from the CIA, it is now up to the CIA to share that information with the FBI, who's the domestic agency, and the State Department in their national security briefs. Guess what? They never told them until August of 2001. And when they told them about the information that they had, they only told them their first name. And then there was another meeting even after that, in, including uh, a CIA case officer by the name of Clark Shannon, who met with Steve Bongard of the New York uh, uh, Washington DC Task Force, Counterterrorism Task Force, and Dina Corsi was there from the FBI. And he basically, there were two meetings, but I'll tell you this one, where Clark Shannon actually tells uh, Steve Bongard and Dina Corsi, um, this was the second meeting in which uh, he told them their names, that it was Khalid al Minardo al Fahazmi, and that they had Saudi visas or passports. But they ne he never said that they had US, US visas. Now, why? Why didn't he say that? In the first meeting, the FBI's own Margaret Gillespie was sent by Alfreda Ann Bukowski, who was at the CIA's Alex Station, and she gave him the photographs of the people that were at the Al Qaeda Kuala Lumpur meeting, Khalad, which is Walid bin Atash, Khalid al Midar, and Wafa Hadi. But she doesn't tell Margaret Gillespie who these people in the pictures are, and she went to the FBI. She says, "Go to the FBI and see if they know who these photo who's people in these photographs." And they had a meeting, and it was Margaret Gillespie, Steve Bongard. I want to say Dina Corsi was there, maybe. Well, anyway, she showed them the pictures. And they said, who is this? Why is the CIA following these people? She goes, I don't know who they are. She goes, you came all the way over here to, to ask us who these people are, and you don't know who they are? And now, so they're distrustful of her. And that's exactly the point. What the CIA was doing was fishing for information, a classic fishing expedition, if you will. They wanted to see if the FBI knew at that point, that was in the summer of 2001. They wanted to see whether they knew 
the people in the pictures. They had no clue. The FBI had no clue who they were. So Kofa Black is a liar. I, All right. We have no evidence that that piece of information was communicated. And that's critical information. Now to the FBI. Sure the is. FBI is at the counterterrorism center. Yes. And so when the counterterrorism center is informed of this information, why is that not automatically then known to the FBI? I, we're trying to connect dots here, folks. The counterterrorism center is one place where the dots are supposed to be connected. And now I want to press the FBI. Since you're at the counterterrorism center, and since that information, I believe, went to the counterterrorism center, why then wasn't the FBI put on notice that two terrorists identified as in early 2000 as terrorists because they had been at those critical meetings in Kuala Lumpur. Why then was that not enough notice, just being at the CTC for the FBI to then say, whoops, wait a minute, these guys have visas to the United States? This guy entered the United States? Why weren't you put on notice? How can you say you didn't know about this until August of 2001? I don't know the answer to that, Senator. And <laughs> uh, there's a volume of information that flows through every day. And I'm not sure where the FBI agents were at the time that might have had access to that cable or not. It might have. They weren't. They didn't have access to the cable. Yeah, they read the cable, but they weren't allowed to share it. Why? Because the CIA wouldn't let them. Who do you blame? Well, you blame George Tenet, Gopher Black, Tom Wilshire, Alfred Ann Bukowski, Michelle Ann Casey. Richard Blee, who was the, the ch head chief of the Alex Station. That's who you blame. Come in from the other division of the CIA. So I can't defend or, or, or say that they saw it and didn't report it. I will say, though, without a doubt, I know that if the agency had it, there was no plot, no thought by anybody at the CIA not to tell us. Well, no. uh, now, Claude Levin even knows, he says, well, there was. Yeah, uh, Dale, they withheld it from you deliberately. And the question is why? Nobody, nobody, well, wait a minute. There was a decision by the CIA not to tell you back in, in June of 2001. We're sitting there at a meeting, and the decision was made at that meeting in New York not to tell the FBI about it. That was a CIA decision. for reasons Yeah, he's talking about the meeting I spoke to you about, Clark Shannon. Clark Shannon actually testified that the Joint House Inquiry it says that he gave, well, he gave, I think he gave written testimony, he couldn't come. Well, he basically said that uh, uh, he was ordered not to share that information with the FBI. Even though George Tenet, and I, and I had that uh, breakdown in my earlier videos, I, I think I did that last year, uh, the infamous uh, video where Carl Evans interviewing George Tenet, Bobby Mueller. And um, George Tenet says, uh, he never said, I never said that. And Clark Shannon basically testified, said, yeah, George Tenet did say that. And which Carl Levin basically told George Tenet, he goes, well, it seems that he told you something different. And George Tenet was like, oh, well. <laughs> that totally mystify me because this is not criminal investigation versus intelligence. This isn't blurring the line, violating rules and regulations. Right. It's got nothing to do with that. This is public visa information. That's this right. Is public travel information, commercial travel information. I understand the rules and regulations about not blurring the line between criminal uh, investigation and intelligence because you don't want to mess up your criminal investigation. But that is not the type of information that the CIA that we're talking about here and that the CIA did not share at that June meeting. But I want to press the FBI. Sir, uh, could, could, could uh, I just say sure. one thing? On, I mean, uh, as we understand it, sir, the CIA analyst was not permitted to provide all the information FBI criminal investigators wanted because of laws and rules against contaminating crim criminal investigators with intelligence information. I, I understand okay. that. that uh, but you're saying that. you could have put it, should have put it on the watch list of the State Department. This isn't the right. Exa that's exactly right. That's a great point Levin brings up. At the very, if you're not going to share the information because of whatever legalities the CIA has about sharing intelligence on a criminal matter, you could have put them on a watch list at least. And they didn't even do that either. They didn't even 
the CIA didn't even share that information even with the Immigration and Naturalization Services. So they didn't not only uh, didn't share with the FBI, they didn't share with the State Department or the INS. I mean, just a, this is remarkable. Like this is unbelievable. And you know, the, here's the real cover up, part of it anyway, huge. Why isn't the truth movement talking about this? Polluting criminal investigation. This is stuff that should have gone on the watch list right. by your own acknowledgement. This is a visa. That's public information. Right. That this is commercial travel. That is public Play with that information. Pencil. There is no pollution of criminal investigation whatsoever under any regulation by simply the CIA telling the FBI, hey, watch these folks. We have identified these folks as terrorists. These folks have entered the United States. That's all you have to tell them. You don't have to go into sources, methods. You don't have to talk right. about wiretaps. You don't have to talk about anything. Just that these folks identified by us have now entered the United Funny, States. Funny, wiretaps. That's the NSA um, in which they were barely ever interviewed. Um, and they were already monitoring the Rafa Hasby cell phone. And that's why they, they, the CIA claims that they lost track of them after they left the Malaysia meeting. Richard Blee actually says that, and they, they uh, closed the Malaysia summit case, right? But the NSA never did. And they found out how many times they called from the United States to Yemen. I think it was like six times. And Khalid al Madar actually left and went to Yemen and came back in 2001. He went to visit his pregnant wife. And amazing. And the CIA even knew that he left and came back and still didn't share the information with anybody. States. That's all we're talking about. There's no violation of any rule, any regulation that I know of by simply telling the FBI that. And I think you acknowledge that when you say we should have notified the State Department to put them on a watch list. That makes it the kind of information which is and should have been available to the FBI. My time is up. If chairman wants to give them time to comment that that would be up to the chairman i would welcome it but i can't press that any further with that red light on certainly if your answer is brief in this response we I just like beg it for uh, in my view i think we're talking about two separate things on one hand we're talking about the the new york meeting uh, between the cia and the fbi and on the other we're talking about the watch listing um issue yes the whole purpose of the system is to provide um this type of information to the and you didn't see that's the point that's the whole point now you know this is a bureaucratic problem right and this is you know we can blame interagency infighting right one agency doesn't want to share with the other agency but like i said yesterday in the live discussion regarding evil danger where schaefer actually says that he was naive to think that all the agencies would be in on the fight together against uh, foreign threats to the country. And that wasn't the case because when Schaefer actually was um, hosting the CIA liaison officers from Alex Station, the CIA basically told him, um, we're not even going to share anything with you because you'll steal our thunder. That's what they said. That was a direct quote. I, I couldn't believe, couldn't believe it, right? He can't believe it. Well, now you can believe it here. I mean, I, I post these all the time. Where, I mean, the CIA basically, you know, um, contradicts their previous statements that they make because they, they write written statements. They do, um, they do an oral statement before they're interviewed. And they want to all come out clean. You know, they say, listen, we tried our best. Alfreda Ann Bukowski was uh, interviewed behind a screen. Um, I believe this was the 9-11 Commission, but that wasn't uh, viewed or uh, wasn't made public. And she said that, yes, I walked over to the FBI office in Washington, D.C. and gave them files regarding Khalid al and Wafa Hasbi. However, here's the problem Bukowski didn't anticipate was that there was no key logging of Alfreda Ann Bukowski ever visiting the headquarters. And she basically told them, you know, the commission staffer said, you, you know, they keep logs of all the people. And she goes, I was in the building. So she basically lied. Just like Kofa Black lies, and just like George Tennant lies. 
what the CIA does for a living. And that's all they'll ever do regarding the events of September 11, 2001.